Hello everyone, my name is Christian, welcome to my hobby vlog. Today we are covering book 12 of Wheel of Time, The Gathering Storm. And we have Cheyenne with us to uh, take part in this therapy session that is book 12. It's definitely going to be that uh, today, <laughs> considering. Yeah, there was a lot of points in this book where I was like, typing angrily or sadly or like, <laughs> just crazy. But welcome back. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. So, what to start with first? I guess fun facts. Uh, yeah, so, well, as uh, you all know, presumably, uh, this was the first book uh, written by Brandon in The Wheel of Time. It was originally uh, supposed to be only one book, but as I've said previously, it would have been huge. It would have been even bigger than the first draft of Oathbringer. That was 500,000 words. And so Brandon was like, no, we have to split it. And I'm not going to split it uh, down the middle or let the publisher split it however they want or do the morning thing of only having some viewpoints. So he rewrote the whole thing, uh, splitting it uh, like in a way that would make sense narratively. But that did cause some timeline issues, which we'll talk about. Uh, but yeah. Uh, the crazy thing about this time in uh, Brandon's career is that he wrote a lot. So we had Gathering Storm. Uh, this and uh, was 2009, maybe 2010. The Way of Kings and the Towers of Midnight came out, and then 2013, Words of Radiance and um, A Memory of Life came out. It was absolutely insane. And so if Brad did ha did it burn out during that section, he, we, we know he won't burn out. St. Peter to the it hospital. Was crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so well, yeah. Um, also, important uh, to note, and I think that this is something that never comes up and so many people have the big misconception that it was misborn. It was actually Elantris, the first half of Elantris, that got Brandon the job of... Uh, finishing the Wheel of Time. That is so shocking to me. <laughs> yeah, and it's, but the thing is, it makes sense. So many people are like, oh, we might choose this worst book, well, because it's his debut. Uh, it's bad, it's a character. Like, no, Elantris is a fantastic book. I mean, sure, we can't compare it against Stormlight, because Stormlight was after the Wheel of Time was written, when the Wheel of Time gave him a huge push. Storm Marks after what? How? I mean, how many years later uh, was Stormlight? From there's a huge change in uh, Brandon's career from Elantris to Stormlight. It's kind of impossible to compare it to Stormlight. Elantris is still a fantastic book. It's a lot more about the characters uh, rather than um, like the plot. It's an analysis of characters, seeing how the characters deal with what is thrown at them, and so many people don't appreciate that because they are used to the uh, big action scenes and cinematic, um, like things like in, that, that we see so much in Miss Born and Stormlight, and also in The Wheel of Time, and, uh, particularly well, with Perrin, for example, um, that they just dismiss Elantris, and Elantris is a great book, and there is a reason, uh, like, Brandon got the job because of Elantris. I mean, Harriet read his uh, eulogy, right? And she read the first half of Elantris and she saw that. She saw the complexity of the world. She saw the ability to handle multiple points of view, the voice uh, Brandon uh, gave the characters. I mean, sure, people complain about Serene and Rayodin, but for example, Brandon has a very distinct voice in her conflict regarding religion. Um, is there and it's something that her Harriet, who is an editor, who, one of the best uh, tour ever had, like she's all, yeah, this guy has uh, the skill to handle the ending of the Wheel of Time, and it's something that a lot of people don't know, and it's a very big misconception. But then I'd like to uh, correct that to make people appreciate the language more for the amazing book that it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was kind of <laughs> interesting that I uh, couldn't really differentiate between 
RJ and Brandon. So I kept texting you. I was like, I just read this scene. I think it's Brandon. It feels like a Brandon scene, but this scene feels like RJ. And so that was really fun to like try and piece together. Yeah, it's uh, hard, and we don't that know like all of them. I mean, RJ didn't write much of it, but we know some of those. And Brandon really did a great job adapting uh, to RJ style and keeping it his own at the same time. But let's go into fun facts. So we did the Elantris one, and then so his sword. I was curious about this. <laughs> yes. So um, yeah. So uh, Rand gets a new sword in this book. And it is just this, Archer Hawkwing, this old, old sword. Uh, they uncovered it on some dig, like archaeological dig. And it got to Rand's, and... But yeah. How do we know it's I mean, they don't sword? exactly talk about it in the books, but... Yeah. Um, there's a line there somewhere that talks about, like, justice, like the concept. And also, I think uh, Brandon confirmed it. I'm not sure, but it is uh, Archer Hawkwing's sword. Hmm. So I remember he found that sword, and I was like, what is this? I was like, this sounds really, like, cool. And so, I'm happy it got confirmed, because that was a question I forgot I had. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. Also, well, we see in this book that, uh, Quindy are, uh, can get destroyed by the true power. And by that, we mean the Dark One's power, because I know some people get confused between the difference between true power, one power, true source, science, I don't, all that. <laughs> uh, so. Was that when he, uh, he broke the domination band? Yes. Okay. Yes, the domination band is made of Quentin DR. And, he, and that's why the seals are breaking, too, because. They're holding back the dark one, and the dark one's uh, power, the true power, uh, can break when they are. Hmm. Is it... Oh my gosh, so Ren used the dark one's power. Yes. Oh my gosh, okay. And that's something that's normally, like, only the Forsaken would have access to. But Ren had access to it, so yeah, it's oh. scary. Um... Like, we'll talk about it when we talk about uh, the last that could be done, that is, uh, the domination chap band the chapter. But... Oh, man. <laughs> um, I didn't process that. That is uh, very interesting. Yeah, there are some people that genuinely th thought, like, genuinely thought that Rand could turn to the dark side. Because of that scene. There's a scene later where I really thought he was, and I can't wait to dive into that. Uh, but yeah. Uh, the other thing, uh, the Sonchan have finally had their first uh, encounters with the Shadow and stopped denying that the Shadow is real, so that's good. Um. <laughs> that was a really funny scene to me because they're like, why'd you bring in the head of a bull? And it's like, here's the human half. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. That Matt guy was right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Yeah, the Gladys Hunter are finally, like, not denying... Uh existence of the shadow so that's good do we want to cover that Varen one later that fun fact oh yeah so we'll go into initial reactions then uh, I kind of want to be a uh, contrarian and say it didn't dethrone Crossroads of Twilight for my favorite book <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm going to be... But you yourself said it, did <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to be a, a good person. Say it is better. I really like this book a lot. Knife of Dreams is really good, but it wasn't, like, this level. So. Because it was, like... We had big stuff happening in, like, the first few chapters. It wasn't the... Okay, you, it, ha, if you haven't read any of the other books, here's what's going on. 
it stops off like, you know, most people have read it. So we don't spend any time wasting, which is great. Yeah, I mean, things like are really getting going and they had already been getting going in, in um, Knife of Dreams, but I mean, it takes a bit. And just it's also like the expectations people have with Brandon as an author. Uh, the person that has been writing uh, Stormlight and Mishpoon, that are very action-packed uh, series, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, like, people have that expectation, so they don't realize just how fast and how crazy Knife of Dream is. And, and like, yeah, sure, things are also uh, crazy here, and it just keeps getting faster because we're um, getting closer to the last battle, but that doesn't mean Knife of Dreams. Uh, isn't fast. Just well, it's been like, I mean, we're just coming out of uh, book ten, and so it takes a bit. But um, you know. Yeah, this one was really good. I really like this book. <laughs> I mean, even the prologue, that first POV we get from the farmer. Yeah. That was like that set the tone. Uh huh. For the next three books for me. I was yeah, like, and it was Here we written go. by Robert <laughs> Jordan. Um, it was? Like, this is, so, there's a pro, there's a scene in every prologue written by Robert Jordan. And it isn't always the first, like it was in this case. But uh, in this case, it, this was the RJ uh, written scene. And remember that RJ was planning uh, for, uh, like, the series to be finished in one book, right? So he had all these things that really set the tone for it. It's real. Um, last battle is coming and it's not good news so uh, this was like one of the things he did to set at that tone and i'm really curious to see if you managed to get uh, which drj scenes are in the uh, next two books yeah i'm definitely going to keep my eye out for it both of them are really great yeah i would i could tell this was a rj section of the prologue because he really went deep <laughs> on the uh, details and all that of the uh, of just the habits of this family this husband and wife and the friend is coming by with all the you know all the furniture and everything it's like you've never done this before why are you leaving and they're like we're gonna go join the battle like melt down what you have uh, your wife's plates are on the table if she wants them still uh, we're leaving, and then he's like, hmm, and like, we get this inner, like, struggle of like, should I believe it or should I not, and he looks up, and like, the clouds, like, rush in, and it's like a big scene, and he's convinced, he's like, okay, like, we need to go, like, right now, and join the fight, and I was like, god, this is so awesome. Yeah, it really sets the tone for what's I mean, last book did already with uh, lines like Mourn if you must mourn on the march for Tarmon Gaon. But really, the ba last battle is starting. Uh, there's no denying it now. Well, some people do, but there really is no denying <laughs> it now. The <laughs> last battle is here. Elida definitely was denying everything. But the last significant part of the prologue that I wanted to note was the death of Massima. Masima. Uh, it's a yes. secret. Fael does it, just slits his throat and just leaves him. And I was like, wow, we yes, wrapped that up finally. fast. <laughs> it was a really satisfying moment for me. I mean, to see like, Fael do it especially and to see her like with the agency that she's gained throughout all this uh, plot line with the Shido. I mean, some people say she doesn't uh, have um uh, you seen this part, but sh sh you really see like the development of her leadership and all that. Just seeing that finishing, like her just killing Masima, it's really satisfying. Yeah, but I don't know. I expected more out of his like storyline, like because it really seemed like it was building to something, and he just runs away from the Shido camp. And then he's killed. And I was like, oh, 
I was like, I thought he was going to have a big thing with Rand. Because Rand did go send Perrin off to go get um, Masima. And, I mean, I guess Rand was too far gone by this point to where it would have not mattered if they met. But, like, I, I wanted that confrontation. Yeah. And I was like, you have been, like, using my name to No, and Masima was also stuff. too far gone. He wouldn't have helped Rand for anything. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it was a good scene. I really liked it, but there's that asterisk. Asterisk. Of like, eh. So. It's just personal uh, opinion, so it's not too bad. But, um. Should we go into the best story, which is Egwene? Oh, sure. So, uh, we're, ha we're at the tower, and we're hanging out with Egwene, and she's doing the chores, going with Sylviana, getting punished, doing all that, and she's, like, actually talking with people openly about, like, going against Elida and, like, all this stuff. So, Egwene's awesome, mm -hmm. and she gets invited to Elida's, uh, rooms, and she's like, do I be openly, like, critical, or do I bide my time? Like, there's this, like, struggle within her. And she goes in there, and everyone, like, every one of the sitters from each Aja, Aja are there. And she's like, yeah, I'm gonna Yeah, and open. people, yeah, and, like, people that she's been working with before, I mean, she's talked with Suena, she talked with Sayerin and Sien. Uh I don't know which of those two is the sitter, or maybe both of them are. Um, she's talked with a lot of the Aja heads. I have a feeling she has talked to Adalorna, the head of the green. Um, Sarancha, probably, who's uh, the gray. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, she's talked to several of the Aja heads, and she's talked to several of the sitters, and she's, like, been telling, like, she's been telling them, like, Elida just isn't fit for leadership, and, um, like, for example, the whites, like, she's helped them solve, like, logical problems that, like, they set her as, like, work. She, I mean, she's proving, like, that uh, she's a good fit for every Aja, well, except the blue, because the blues aren't there, but, um, then she gets, like, called in, and it's Elida, right? She's, of course, very <laughs> frustrating. Uh, Elida um, like, starts talking about another um, another oath, like an oath of obedience for uh, the Aes Sedai and all that. And I have to admit, Iwai is being a bit hypocritical about the oath of obedience. Obedience because she has uh, required one for several lines that I am mean, for um, Morel and who's the other one? The other one uh, involved with the whole land thing uh, to Igwin. So she is being a bit hypocritical about that point. But um, just a light is being a light, and of course, Igwin just snaps. And well, uh, she tells us F8 line uh, to Elida, <laughs> but I suspect the Dark One would be perhaps embarrassed to associate with you. Elida screech, weaving up in the flash of the one power, slamming Egwene back against the wall. That line <laughs> is so good, first of all. Second of all, it just represents everything that Egwene has been doing to undermine Elida from the inside right now. And you, like, Egwene is like, Elida is but when she genuinely believes she has so best interest at heart, but she just isn't going about it the right way. She's crazy, really. I mean, not crazy in the way that like Rand is crazy, but she doesn't know how to handle the power. And this is just, I mean, she's been demoting, like I said, I to accept it, and obviously it's like, tap of the Shimmery, and she's been um, giving penances to others. And here she is being a tyrant, and we just gets back at her with this line, and of course a lie that loses control and starts beating her with the one power, which is against how 
<laughs> and so while well, everyone is just furious at Adelaida. Yeah, because that was one of my favorite parts. Is It's like a 30 page chapter. It's a really long one. And she it's just like all dialogue. Just her undermining and debating and, you know, logicking out like everything she's done wrong. And everyone agrees with Egwene about this. Yeah, and I mean, then we find out uh, Sylveon, like, agrees with Egwene, like, um, I mean, Egwene has been having her talks with Sylveon as well, and when they sent Egwene to the, um, uh, like, to the dungeon, thing, boy, she finds out uh, that, like, Sylveon has stood up for her, and, like, agreed, and tried to get Elida the post, but it's not really enough. So. Yeah, and there's a part that I just remembered in the early chapters of the Egwene storyline, where she visits um, uh, Liana, and a bubble yeah. of evil happens, and the floor starts mm -hmm. like bubbling, and like I was shocked that like. It, it bit it. I don't know. Because, like, everything's crazy right now at the tower. Rooms are switching around and people are ignoring it and not doing anything about it. They're like, oh, the red chambers just <laughs> got to the 22nd floor. Oh well. And, like, it's so frustrating to read because Egwene is like, the last battle is coming. We need to do something about it. And they're like, nope, nope, nope. And so, the end of this uh, book was so refreshing of how it goes. And I was just so happy to get that. You want to finally allow us to go back. We'll talk about uh, the end. The resolution of the light of the Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you want to allow us to go back to the novice quarter. <laughs> And who does she fuck? But Baron. <laughs> oh, and by the way, that dress you're wearing is green. Yeah. <laughs> I got dropped when I uh, read that. And to be honest, I also knew it was coming, like you did. It's still like the execution is just perfect. Yeah, it's funny because. Right, it's like, it is. Like an RJ rated scene. This was one of the ones that RJ left for, um, Brandon. And it's so good. <laughs> like, Varen's my favorite character ever. She's, like, so, uh, like, academic. Like, I really like that part of her. And so I always really liked everything she did, like, throughout all the books. And so, when we get the reveal, that she's Black Aja, I was like, oh, she's a super duper double agent. Like, okay, good, it makes sense now. Because I was so resistant, being like, oh no, this is gonna be an epilogue, like, scene. She's gonna be like, ah, ha, ha, I've been uh, foiling all of you this entire time. But she isn't. We get it like three quarters of the way through the book, and out of nowhere, because she's with Matt before the scene. And I was like, yes. I knew of that, like, that spoiler at that point. I was like, oh no, she's going to kill Matt. <laughs> it's like, and I was just like, I don't believe for a second that Varen is a bad person. And it ends up that she was tricked into the Black Aja. And I was so relieved. So she, well, being Varen, she, like, she was very close to discovering them, right? And they just went and said, like, Either you join us or we'll kill you because you can't, like, like we can't let uh, the information get out because Varen is very, very intelligent. And so she, um, so she did, uh, join the Black Raja, but used the opportunity, like, to study 
work, I guess. Uh, but uh, the elf, uh, uh, dark wire, like, so strong that she couldn't uh, use that information. Um, unless, like, like, she couldn't reveal to anyone because it's an elf, like, on the elf, all right. And, um, she couldn't revealed until she was dying, and she couldn't find the oath rod because the black archer hunters had it. Well, she intentionally poisoned herself, and she went to go look for Egwene to give her the information she had that uh, no folks. Uh, with, like, all the... Um, like, with all the names she had found, and Baron was... Like, she found most of them, really. So, I mean, she got really close, and I'm sure some got away uh, later on, but Baron did a lot for the extermination of the Black Kaja just before the last battle. Yeah, this is definitely one of those scenes where, like, after I read it, I was just, like, sitting there, like, in depression, because <laughs> I did not think it would go this way, because I didn't know she was going to die. She sacrificed herself for the greater good. And I was just imagining, like, the TV mm -hmm. show, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be such a great reveal for the TV show. Like... Yeah. The thing is, like, there is a ton of foreshadowing for this if you look back. I'm not going to say it all because I want you to discover it on Reread. But you look at it and it's like, Jordan, how? Just how? Because, like, <laughs> there's one in book two that almost everyone catches, but by the time this reveal comes along, a lot of people forget about it, right? And, um, but there is still a lot, like, after that. It's like, how? Just how? She dies, and they pass her off as sleeping, and, uh, one of the secret... Uh, supporters of Egrain show up, and she's like, hey, oh, take that darling. body away. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so they take the body away, and then the Sanshin attack. Well, no, no, she's in the, uh, she's no, in she Tarawana. goes to Tarawana. Yeah. yeah, and she tells, uh, so on about, like, oh my gosh, and she's like, now watch Mori and Shiryam, uh, the Black Gars are, like, are real, and, like, so on is, like, super in denial, of course. Because, I mean, Shiri, um, yeah, well, I was just novices, and Moria was a sitter for a long time. And, like, they're both blue, and so, I mean, she's like, watch them. And then she gets pulled out of the dream by Nicola waking her because the Sanchan are attacking. And this is, like, this part, like, I'm, when the Sanchan attack is done and not, but before that, like, this is really some of the best Egwene in the whole series, because... <laughs> She's leading by example, right? She uh, organizes the knob, lets them, she teaches them how to link, and it gets the, um, the gag we can go for, for a sound, we all that stuff. The power rod, what you were saying? Uh, the fluted rod Egwene uses, because she uh, goes with four feet. The link or the sound, we also, she uses them. Like, she organizes the resistance, and then we get uh, that Sayaren point of view, or seeing Sayaren. And then, and then, there's a disturbance on the 22nd level, that's, and she's like, the brown borders, and she's like, wait, no, bubbles of evil, though. Um, it's the floors have changed, the novice quarters, and she's like, Egwene, it has to be her. <laughs> so funny. No, the, but yeah, I mean, Plus, I like, have no idea what's going on. <laughs> They're frankly like just incompetent uh, in the scene. Kill has a point uh, with that in some ways, right? Because like we actually have no idea uh, what to do. I mean, the battle laws are useless, really. A great. Ah, uh, great scene. Uh, and also, you've been waiting for this since how long? Book five. <laughs> since we first started yeah, doing episodes. Yeah, like, just wait. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, you have to wait for Gathering Storm. Because, like, we did get, like, the uh, prediction, right? Like, the foretelling, if I'm not mistaken about this um, dream. And yeah. This is the Battle of the Tower. They're going to retake the tower. And, well, of course, the to tower is broken by then. And I was like, you have to wait for Gathering Storm. We're going to have to wait for a long, long time. Uh, for to get your uh, uh, your tower battle. Yeah, because that was one thing that like I was waiting on like for so long since book five, our first episode back in like March. It's like a court four months later. <laughs> And I'm now getting it, and I'm just like, I was so happy. I was like, I don't even know where we're going now after this. Last battle? That's like the last big event I, like, that I have predicted. Or know of. So I'm like, I have no idea what the next book is going to be like. And especially in Memory of Light. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's uh, really, really crazy. Um. I mean, we do have Towers of Midnight left, and uh, keeping in mind part of that do overlap, like, timeline-wise with this book. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to um, pairing and Rand uh, math. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this was the Wayne's Rand book, really. And even though we don't get that many Rand points of view, let me see him a lot externally. And the next book is uh, Parents and Maths. Uh, for the most part. Well, that'd be exciting. Because uh, so I had a prediction that Tower of Midnight is another way of saying Tower of Genjai, so I'm happy to see that that's probably gonna be true. <laughs> yeah. As dumb, the titles for these books like, tend to be like very metaphorical. It's not so much of like a place or a thing, but it's a little bit it's more about like the epigraphs like are written. Uh, there's one like the I think one of the Sunshine prophecies mentions the Tower of Midnight or something like that, right? So like the latter half of the series tends to be named after those uh, prop uh, epigraphs rather than like anything actually in the book. Um, just to wrap up the Egrain section. We do get a Swan and Gareth scene where they bond, which I, for some reason, never thought would happen. Like, I never predicted that. It makes sense. That was just one of those where I was, like, shocked when it happened. I was like, oh, yeah. Like, that makes sense. I was, like, really excited yeah. by that. And Garwin and them uh, decide to go rescue Egwene against her wishes, which I'm fine with. But. Yeah, although, I mean, <laughs> when uh, the Sanchan attack, I mean, they sent off the blood knives, right? To, uh, like, just kill as many as they could. And so, if they hadn't rescued Wayne, she'd have been just lying and she'd have likely be killed like, because of the exhaustion. So, she's mad at them. And, well, yeah. But, like, they were right. Uh, to rescue and Egwene. Like, once the Sunshine attack is over, I start having problems with Egwene and the way she's acting because, well, first the way she treats Gawain. Like, sure, we don't like Gawain, but still, Gawain <laughs> doesn't deserve to be treated that way, right? Yeah. And uh, the way she treats uh, Silwan, like, yeah, so it was like, so, so again, the Sunshine were attacking. We would have been killed. I mean, she doesn't know about the blood. Wouldn't have been killed if they hadn't gone in for her. And, um, she just isn't being very nice. Then we get to her speech, like, when the tower was like, Oh, are you not good? And she's like absolving and was like, all oh, like, because she condemns everyone else, like, for like splitting the tower for the uh, rival tower for raising an alien. And she was part of that. And she isn't. Um, 
Like she isn't admitting that's what she was. She excludes herself from that group. And she gets a bit too caught up in the fact that she's Amaro and uh, and yeah. Yeah, I really like the scene where she is kind of just chastising everybody. And I like that she admits that she went wrong too by becoming Yes, a... but it, that, I mean, she says that, uh, oh yeah, like, I, I was the armor for the rebel tower all that. But she's punishing everyone else and she isn't, like, the armor for the rebel tower and that wasn't. If we shouldn't have done that, but like when she starts punishing and like the elves and like all that, um, she like, she's absolving herself. And, like just look at the quote and the way she talks. She is like it's she's, like she's not admitting are her fault. Like sure she says it, but the punishment that she talks about. Uh, like, what's the other artist that I'm going to have to do to uh, come back? She's excluding herself from all that. And I really, like, that's the hypocritical part of Big Wayne. It's the same thing, well, I mean, not less that, but the same thing that happened way back in Fires of Heaven with that scene in I Need and Teleron Riyadh, right? She's telling other people uh, that something they're doing is wrong when she is doing the exact same thing. And so that bothers me. But, I mean, she's uniting. She united the tower. Like, at the end of this, we see everyone's back together, and she didn't punish the Reds. She, um, she chose a Red as her keeper, which I love. I, I love Sylviana. Sylviana is amazing. Yeah, but, like, uh, every time, like, I was, like, sad that uh, she, like, got Red Ash in the cruise, but I'm like, but they're good Reds. And I'm referring in particular to Sylviana and Pevara because those two are amazing and they're my favorite uh, reds in the third age and um, but I can't tell her who they are because she's only on book two and I'm like <laughs> but they are good reds <laughs> yeah I always tell uh, Alf I'm always like they are very passionate and I, I can't say anything else because I like Sylviana yeah Sylviana's amazing and <laughs> choosing Sylviana as her keeper is definitely one of the best has made. It brought the Reds to her side, which was like, that, I didn't know how she was gonna do that. And it was a perfect decision, so. <clears throat> do you yeah. want to do the epilogue now? Since it is the same POV? Um, uh, no. We'll, no, we need to talk about Rand first. <laughs> oh, man. He's not okay. <laughs> He really isn't. I mean, this is the height of what the fandom calls Dark Rand or Darth Rand or all that. And it's also, from here, like, as I said uh, last time, like, from here on out, this is my favorite part of Rand to read. It's just written so well. It is a master class in point of view. Rand nailed RJ String. Um, I mean, we see... I think the most Rand scenes, like I mentioned, like aren't from his point of view. He from his world point of view when he shows up in Aradoma. And see him from two on point of view when he uses the Shanch. And we see it from Min's point of view when he destroys Nathan's barrel. And we really see how scary Rand is uh, through external life. And I was about to make a Dresden comparison, but I can't because you haven't read that, have you? Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting like, <laughs> any of these big events reading his story. Like, it just blew me away every time something huge happened. I was like, oh my gosh! Just like freaking out. Every time. Yeah, it's uh, crazy, really. Um, but with, from Tuan's point of view, she talks about the dark aura that Ren has like, around him. Like, we see that, like, sense of, like, terror and fear. And, like, the red could possibly go to the dark side of. Yeah, I wouldn't blame Tuon for what she did. 
I mean, no, me neither. I'm really curious what that black aura was, because I I had a joke theory a couple books ago that it's not Lucerin in Rand's head; it's the dark one. And this book, I actually saw thinking about it seriously, because there's a lot of weird moments, L like the black aura, and I was like, and especially with the ending of what he does, where the voices stop. I was like, huh. So... Yeah, we'll talk about Veins of Gold, because that is one of my favorite chapters in the whole series. It is absolutely amazing. And, like, it's one of those that you know the chapter title. Like, somebody says Veins of Gold, that everyone in the fandom immediately knows what they're talking about. They're talking about Ransopotheosis, right? So, yeah. But before that, we need to talk about the last that's going to be done. Another chapter title that everyone knows, really. Um, the nomination band, essentially. So, Ren is just not doing well, right? Just pure, like, dark Ren at this point. And then uh, Semurag gets freed by Shida Heron. And uh, Elsa, uh, I forgot what, what uh, she is, green, maybe? Uh, reveals that she's uh, black, and she gives... Uh, Semrog the uh, domination band, right? And so Semrog like, gets it on Rand, and well, of course, like really against him. Semrog makes him like start choking, I um, mean, like practically killing her. And like, it's to the brink of death, I mean, it's. That uh, Rand, uh, he's like trying to find the way to get out of it, and he senses uh, the true power, which is different from the true sword, and it is different from the one power. The true sword and the one power are the same thing, right? The one power that drives the wheel of time, it's side in and side out. The true power is the dark one's power, which normally only the Forsaken would have access to. But Rand, for some reason, hasn't. Like, Lucerne is complaining. He's like, no, 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 no. This is the Dark One's power. This is what started the War of the Shadows. This is what um, Yaren unleashed when she opened the war. Like, no, 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 no. But Lucerne, um, like, really didn't want to see such, uh, the true power. Uh, but, like, it was the only way. So Rand does. Then he breaks the domination band, even if it's Quen DR, because the true power can break Quen DR. That's why the seals are breaking, right? It's the Dark One's power that uh, is the only thing capable of uh, breaking Quen DR. And just goes and bail fires uh, Semirag and Nelson. It's like, the true power is something that's none of the. Like, none but the Forsaken have access to. That's what makes a Forsaken, the fact that they have access to the true power. Um, because, like, you, sure, you can be a very powerful Dreadlord or whatever, and you still won't be a Forsaken if you don't have access to the true power. And Rand, for some reason, does. And this is a point where some people genuinely think that Rand could have turned to the dark side after this, because it's practically rock bottom for him. Um, and you can really see, like, how well, like, Brandon took, uh, to Rand's POV and, like, to his voice here because he wrote this in magnificently. Sure, Rob Orchard and outlined it, but this scene was written by Brandon, and it's amazing. It's, there's a reason this is one of my favorite scenes in the whole book, as terrifying as it is. It brings back a uh, less terror of, uh, like, uh, the color, right? I mean, coloring is... It is terrifying, and... I was going to say something, but I can't. Um, and... Like, Brandon just nailed it. One thing I'm... I mean, the fact that he's forced to kill me, the... Uh, the... Um, like, hesitance Min has after him. Like, Min does, like isn't happy like to be around him because she's scared. She is genuinely scared of what Rand was forced to do. She could have very easily died if Rand hadn't managed to break through. 
Yeah, one thing I'm wondering about is maybe he got access to that true power because he was linked with uh, Samahaj through the band. That's all I can think of. Like, nope. That, it was different. Oh, and you'll see. Uh, I mean, like, Rand does get the saw in his eyes, like the little like black things uh, that, for example, uh, Moradin has. Uh, those are remnants, like, of the true power, like, when, like, you get too much of them, I mean, that's why Baal's eyes were, like, all fiery and, like, burning and all that, because you had used too much of the true power and it had burned away. Hmm. <laughs> okay, well... So that just doesn't make sense from a link for it. Uh, especially be because in like a forced link, uh, like the Adam and the Domination Men are like the person holding the bracelet is the one that's in control. Yeah, I'm just, it's so worrying now that he has, he's basically a Forsaken like, in terms of skill set. And there's some implications. <laughs> Although the end chapter does give me hope. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the end, I mean, the end chapter absolved that, uh, really. But um, before that, I mean, Rand could have very well turned to the dark side. And the fact, I mean, we are twelve books in. The fact that Rand still gave us like that worry, the fact that Rand could very well turn to the dark side. It's that's called skill. <laughs> and Rand had absolutely nailed Rand's point of view. Um, well, he exiles Catswain because. And there's a rock bottom, and he's very mad at Catswain for letting the Domination Band go, and it's not really her fault. Nothing to do about it. And uh, then, uh, well, they go to um, the Domain. Yeah, Terra Domain. And like, like Bush Darian, they like. Want like the uh, the sea folk uh, ships arrive, and turns out all the food is spoiled because like what I was talking about last time, like the dragon is one with the land, the land is one with the dragon, uh, and like things are just so unstable that uh, food is spoiling everywhere, people are dying, it's terrible, and Rand just abandons the people he can. Uh, really. He sends uh, Geralda to um, Saldea um, to um, to hold off uh, the attack of the blight there, so the Trollocs won't invade the rest of Rand land, but he just abandons the people uh, at Arrow Dome and. and that, you know. Also, uh, last book uh, when you're we talking about it, or all this POV and the uh, prologue. Remember that he said uh, he planned for everything short of the dragon reborn himself just appearing out of nowhere in front of his face. Exactly what happened. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so at this point, really, the only one he trusts is Nynaeve, which is, of course, really hard on Nynaeve because nobody else can really talk to or, like, control Rand at this point. And uh, they find out uh, that uh, Grandal is at an old fortress called Nature's Barrow. And uh, Rand does this uh, trickery where he like, gets uh, Grandal to put um, compulsion, like, on a messenger he sends. And, um, like, when the messenger comes back, well, he knows that, like, it's a compulsion, like, this appears that, well, Grandal will be dead, right? Because she's, like, sending it to weave anymore, right? 
And so then he just turns into Bale Fires, uh, Matron Sparrow, killing uh, Granville and also everyone else inside. It's like the big portraits. I mean, they're like ordinary people. Like, sure, all of them are uh, under compulsion, but there are ordinary people there. He just Bale Fires it. I think really like this is a like rock bottom friend is like his darkest point and Brand is really scary. I mean, we see the scene through Min's point of view and Brand is absolutely terrifying and like, the way he just hardly flinches again when he destroys uh like well fail firing all those like cutting them out of existence, right? And like not even giving them a chance to be reborn at some point in the pattern. No, just bail fires. Just to get the chance to kill Grandal. Yeah, one thing I really liked about that scene is that there's a point where as it's like after it bell fires everything, men notices that they that the entire world is like pulsing and trying yep. to write itself. Bell scream. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, please don't fall apart. Yeah, that's a very real risk at this point because so many people have been using Balefire and Rand just goes ahead and teaches it to nourishment. Of course, Cap's right his map about the beast. Balefire is really dangerous. They really shouldn't be using it. Also, props to Daidi. Our girl healed compulsion. She was able to unravel the weave, which is really hard, especially with a master of compulsion like Grand Dolly's. So, yeah. I be once again doing the impossible. I really like Nynaeve's chapters in this book, although she is revolving around Rand. But like, she's the adult in the room. I hated Katsuan in this book. She is just so annoying to me now. I, I, I thought we would never see her again, and she's just following Rand. Because she's yeah. working around his words of, I don't want to see your face again. So she just covers her face. And it's like hanging out. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's like, I hate Kazuan. She is very well written though. And like, she does have a point that Rand needs to regain control of his emotions if he's going to survive the last battle. And that's why he recruits her Leia, for example, and I need. But she also went and related Rand with him, and I won't forgive that. But she's an amazingly written character. She's one of those other brands that took to their point of view, like, very well. And so... Then, uh, well, Rand, like, returns to here. Uh, all that. And... Uh, Nynaeve uh, tricks uh, him into uh, revealing a uh, parent location. And she goes to get Tam, right? And this is like part of the timeline thing, right? Uh, we'll see in uh, Towers of Midnight. Uh, like, the scene like that, uh, the colors. Like, Rand is like seeing like the colors of like when he thinks about the others, he, like he sees the colors and like you can see where they are, right? Like the same with Perrin and Matt uh, for Rand and for like each other, right? And so like you'll see that scene like under the statue. Because that was one of the things, like, the book getting split it, split the way it did, but Brandon needed to make uh, veins of gold the end of this book, right? Uh, so, like, technically, in the timeline, Perrin isn't there uh, yet. Like, we don't see Perrin there in this book, because Perrin is my next book, right? Uh, but, and so, next book, like, we'll go back to the beginning and see Tam and Perrin's camp. So don't be confused that, like, wait, Tam wasn't here. No, it's a uh, timeline uh, thing, and that's why it's not really to pay attention to the colors, because they'll give you people up for everyone is. But, uh, Nini tricks ran into revealing parents' location, because uh, Catherine knows Tam is a uh, parent somehow. And uh, they go get uh, Tam, and Catherine tells him to talk with Rand to try and get him. Uh, to, like, chill, uh, really, that's what it is, and it's a very, very awkward conversation when Tam and Rand reunite, um, and, like, Rand knows the truth about his parentage, 
can tell no the fan knows him. But Fran is like the most powerful person in the world right now. And still it's kind of adorable until things go wrong. Tam is father of the year. Tam is the kind of father we need more of in the Cosmere. Yes. <laughs> well, I really yeah, thought Tam, Tam was going to die. Tam is an amazing father and he's really what Randa needs. Yeah. Uh, but of course then he makes the mistake of mentioning Caswain and Randa just loses it and he nearly bail fires Tam until he realizes what he's doing and stops himself uh, just in time. He just just gave ways away because he, he's scared of what he did. I really thought Tam was gonna die at this time. I was freaking out like yeah. I couldn't put the book down. And I was like, he's gonna do it. This is his first one. Like his first family kill. And he got away, and we immediately see Tam's reaction, and I totally understood Tam's reaction of just how pissed he was at Cat Swan. Because Cat Swan is like, shut up, child. Like, you do what I say. And I'm like, shut yeah. up, Cat Swan. Like, you almost got Tam killed. Like, because you are withholding information. Yeah, Tam was totally justified in just going off at Cat Swan afterwards. And that scene is so great. Um, just because of Tam's like, like, what the f*** you do to my son? It's, I love Tam. Tam is amazing. Can't wait to see him in the show. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And so Rand travels to Abu Dhar, like he's like in disguise, right? He's like, he's like comparing uh, the Sun Chan and all the people that live in uh, Sun Chan as the people he's supposed to be protecting. Destroy the world because, uh, like everything. I'm really happy he ended up failing on doing the big balefire thing again, because that was like he was like throwing up everywhere on the ground, and he was like readying the big balefire thing like he did at uh, to Grandel. And I was just like, please don't do this. I was like, this is just going to make everything go bad. Everyone's looking at him while he does this. And he gates he gateways away. Which I was like, oh, thank God. Like, he's not going to be caught. Yeah, I mean, because... Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, he can't be, because a uh, normal that won't hold uh, a man. The domination band is, like, really the only... Like, as far as we know, like, the only one, uh, around. And, but, like, I'm just falls over because of the nausea, and he's like, no, I... And he, uh, gave it away to, uh, Dragon Mount. Um, he, just, like, talking with him there, and, like, I don't know, I'm like, I'm gonna kill the world, and... They like destroy the world, really. I mean, and there's just rock bottom right now. And then uh, Liz Theron, one of my favorite lines, like, and I was like, why, like, why, why should we keep on living? Why should the world be extinct? We're gonna die anyway. And I'm saying, like, because every time we live, we get to love again. And that just snaps Rand out of it, and he turns away the power of the trilogy and well, like. Rather than using it to destroy the world, he turns it like on the Chorodi and Khan destroys it. And it's just like a apotheosis moment, really. This like cla this striking clarity that he has now, and he understands the. Uh, sky is open above him. Um, we see the epilogue from uh, Egwene's point of view, and uh, they see uh, sunshine at the top of Dragon Mouth. And it's just hope, right? Uh, the fact that Egwene I tell.
uh, like we are like mark the date something important happened. <laughs> like it really is like fans of both heroes and the start and there is a reason like from here on out the fandom calls uh, this version of Rand the Jesus Rand Rose and Rand <laughs> because of that because like, Rand has come to understanding with himself he knows that <sighs> Lucerne was just always a part of himself like sure he has the memories because he's Lucerne reborn uh, but the that what he was doing is essentially the same thing Shalon does with uh, Veil and Radiant. And he was assigning those memories to a different personality to be able to deal with it, to deal with his madness. It is something common, like, among uh, men who can channel. And so Lucian was always just a part of him, and they reintegrated, and he's at peace with those memories. Oh, so it's not the doctor. Just one. such a powerful <laughs> thing. Nope. Nope. <laughs> just shooting that down right now. It's not the dark one. It's just essentially a case of the ID. Oh, okay. I had no idea. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, what I wanted to talk about. Like, this scene specifically is what I'm like, when we were talking about 900 years ago, I was like, I wanted to say that. Uh, like, when uh, LZT took uh, control like of uh, side in. You're like, oh, this is bad. And I'm like, this, this is just Rand. It's just Rand in his madness that he's just acting as Luz Darren would and he like using his voice because he does have those memories. I mean, those memories like, are real. But I mean, up to like what's never really there. It's just Rand's madness, a manifestation of Rand's madness that Rand separated off to be able to deal with it and stay sane as long as, long as possible. And that's why you see it's like, like there's this uh, description in Lord of Chaos. Oh, wait a sec. Oh, that I, I just copied earlier today for my extended assignment. Um, you wait and I'll read. Because it makes all the sense in the world, uh, he says. Um, the others, the, wet, the wetlanders, he thought dryly, called him the dragon reborn and never speculated on what that meant. They believed he was the rebirth of Luther and Telamon, the dragon, the man who had sealed the hole into the dark one's prison and ended the war of the shadow 3,000 years ago and more. And then the age of legends as well, when the dark one's last counter stroke came that side in and every man with the channel began to go insane, starting with Luther and himself and his other companions. They called Rand the Dragon Reborn, and never suspected that some part of Luster and Telamon might be inside his head, as mad as the day he had begun the time of madness and the breaking of the world. As mad as any of those male eyes that I who had changed the face of the world beyond recognition. It had come on slowly, but the more Rand learned of the power, the stronger he became with Sidon, the stronger Luster and his voice became, and the harder Rand had to fight to keep the dead man's thoughts from taking over. Like, this last sentence, like, in particular, it really shows like the progression of Rand's madness. Like that's why it starts coming on during like Pirates of Heaven, for example, and Rand is starting to like actually learn channeling uh, from Asmodian. And it's it's Rand just dealing with the madness that comes from using Sidon. Because if you remember uh, towards the beginning, I was saying like if I don't uh, use. Uh, like, if I don't use it, then I'll be fine. And you'll see that, like, for example, with the people who went into, like, channel less. And, like, of course, it depends uh, from person to person, but the people at channel they tend to be able to uh, stay sane longer. And so the more Rand learned to channel, the more those memories, like, manifest and Rand just, and, like, the more uh, crazy. And became, and so he, what he resorted to doing was splitting them off as a separate personality. Uh, that transformed into uh, like Lucerne because well, they're his memory, and um, and just to be able to deal with it, it's it's the same thing Shalon was doing. Uh, so. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So it's not. And like it's a... common, uh, actually. 
Yeah, it's not in, another in entity. Mental channel. Like, because I thought... Nope. Like, because that was the first, like, one of the first theories I had in Fires of Heaven. Was that eventually, Luce Theron and Rand would... I guess I was right, I just realized. And that they would integrate. But I thought it was like they would have, like, Lucerne would take over his body. Which technically didn't happen. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I did get the part right that they would integrate. And that was just like a thing I threw out. That's kind of impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the context, like, wasn't right, but they did integrate because, like, Lustein was all along. It's the same thing. That spoilers for Rhythm of War happened with Vale and uh, Shalon at the end. And sure, integration isn't the solution for every case of DID. This is not a Starlight podcast, so let's get too much into that. But, like, it was a solution here because Randa needed to come to peace with, like, who Lucerne was. And those memories aren't going away. Of course they're staying. Uh, because, well, Randa is Lucerne reborn, right? He's the dragon reborn. But, like, he's finally at peace with them. That's kind of interesting, then, because Matt has the same thing, but Matt didn't go crazy. He was just kind of like, ah, storm them. Well, I guess, uh... Whatever. Yeah, mats are Custom. different, really, because yeah. mats are, like, it's not just of, like, being reborn. Well, because, like, he is, like, the soul of the gambler, and that's one of those that gets spinned out, like, every, uh, like, cycle of the wheel. But, well, he also has the ones that the elven and the elven gave him, uh, too. Like, fill in the holes, but it's different. Like, Randy. Matt is well aware that those memories aren't his and that like you know like it's different right it's not like Matt I don't know how to explain it oh really <laughs> but like Matt like isn't going crazy and he uses uh, those memories to his advantage there's a reason he's such a tactical genius because well he has all that ex uh, like shared experience Okay. Well, on that note, should we move on to Matt? <laughs> That's an yep. awesome transition. <laughs> um, so they're on the way to Camlin, I believe. A major city yes. somewhere. And the only yeah, part that I... Fun. Yeah, the only part I thought was noteworthy was the bubble of evil. Weird pattern stuff going on. They go to a city, which I should have wrote down the name of. Or a town, I guess. A town? Uh, Hinderstab. Okay. So he, they go there, and they're trying to buy supplies. And they find out that, you know, yeah. there's papers with his face on it, and it's a woman, probably Isolite, looking Parent. for him. And, yeah, it's with Perrin, too. And uh, everyone just seems off, like, the whole time. And they're trying to figure it out. But they're being nice, but they're like, please go before the sun sets. And they're like, one more die boy, one more toss, is what Matt says. And they're like, talking with each other, like, secretly, trying to figure out if they should. And finally, they're like, okay, get it done, do it now, and we'll get your supplies ready while you do it. Or whatever. And some of us will stay to make sure it's not like a fluke. And the sun sets, and Everything just goes crazy. Hell breaks loose. Everyone is trying to kill each yeah. other. People are like digging the fingernails into everyone's faces. All the kids are fighting each other. Like it's really horrific scene. <laughs> I was like, yeah, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, so uh, The Wheel of Time isn't a horror series. But it does have like those like moments of horror, and I really hope they keep them in the TV show, even if I'm not a horror fan in general, uh, because it really makes the Wheel of Time unique. And so Kinderstep is one of those. It's just pure terror because of this bubble of evil. Everyone is trying to kill themselves, and it's just one of those. And of course, Sanderson breaks out his best cinematic writing 
right? Uh, because he, I mean, he may not have gotten Matt's voice right, and we'll talk about that because I want opinions. Uh, but he's good at writing these cinematic fight scenes. I mean, we see it in Stormlight, we see it in Newsboom, we see it all over the place with Brandon's writing. And so Matt just is like trying to defend himself and to rescue the, uh, the ice like, to get them out of there, to get like all the band out of there, right? Because it's just so terrifying, uh, really. And so, like, Tamsin doesn't get down, like, in the details of, like, the blow-by-blow blow of, like, everything that's happening. Like, for example, Martin would. But he shows us uh, what is happening. We see Matt just, of course, being as talented as he is, like, with the spear and just doing everything he can to get, like, everyone uh, out of there. And, like, I was well aware that this stuff was coming, like, ages ago, before I uh, started the Wheel of Time. Oh, can you hear me? Wheel of Time is terrifying. And I had forgotten about most of those scenes that you mentioned there, but there were two that stuck with me. Yep. Oh, no. Well, just now, yeah. So, there were two that stuck with me. Uh, one, the Golam. And two... Hinderstab. And so I was well aware Hinderstab was coming because I had looked at the table of context and I saw a knife on Hinderstab. So I like, expressly organized so that I wouldn't be reading this chapter in the middle of the night uh, because of that. It's really just one of those horror moments in the series and it's really well written. And like, sure, we have uh, like Matt's voice, isn't it? Right? Matt was that character Brandon most struggled with because Matt is a very complex character and he's very layered. He isn't just like the typical like comic relief. I mean he isn't the lopen. He is intelligent and he uh, really cares uh, like deeply about his friends even though he says he's not a hero. <laughs> uh, but and so Matt is really a complex character. Brandon really struggled. Um, with him, which is part of the reason he isn't as much in uh, Gathering Storm. Um, but uh, this scene is uh, great. So they go out the next day. Um, they come back to town and everybody's as bad as rain. I uh, like sure the property are like, damaged and all that, but everybody's perfectly fine and everyone is so confused. And, well, the mayor explains, uh, like, what happened. But, yeah, I really liked... Because I was one... I think I texted you right after the sequence. And I was like, why is this mm -hmm. happening? And I think you probably said Raffo. And I was like... And you were like, just read the next chapter. Because it does stop when they go to bed. Yeah. And they wake up and the two hostages they took disappeared. And they're like... They were just the, there, like, literally a minute ago. Like, we were looking at them, like, a minute ago. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And I had a theory that ended up being right, is that this is the unraveling of the pattern, and that it resets itself, like, every day. Yes. And I was like, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. Like, I really like how that um, was executed, so... Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Matt, I do want to ask you, how did you feel about the way Sanderson wrote Matt? Because there are some people that have very big problems uh, with it, as I said, because like Matt was one of those characters Brandon struggled to write with. They don't think it was like Jordan's Matt. They think uh, Sanderson treated Matt a bit more like a character with a, like a character like uh, Wayne or Lopin or um, Lyft, like because Brandon's sense of humor is different. Yeah, I didn't really notice much of a difference. Like, I knew ahead of time that he had a big issue writing Matt. And I remember he said the same about Pat and Fane. So I, was, I wasn't I was really surprised after the fact that Pat and Fane didn't show up and Matt was a really low, like, uh, not activity, but like low appearance in terms of how many chapters there were. Because it is a small section, kind of in the 25% to 50%. And as a 
I'm not a big fan of Lopin. I think I've said that before. The novella helped with my feelings on him. But I still can't stand his humor. And so, uh, I thought it was in line, his humor with Matt. I mean, he says all the same curses and all that. But I'm interested in next book, because he said that is... Actually, he doesn't. Huh? Um, oh, he doesn't. The curses uh, change, like, the order. Like, it's not blood on bloody ashes. Uh... And, like I didn't, I never noticed this reading. This, this is something uh, Drew pointed out, or uh, Rob, one of them, uh, when they were talking about this, especially in Towers of Midnight. Um, and um, they pointed out that the curse is like it's the same spirit of like the blood and ashes thing, but they change. Uh, and so I never really noticed that. But I definitely see that, like, the, um, it, Tangerine's Man is definitely different yeah. than Jordan's. And we'll talk about this more next book again, because it's more Matt's book, but. Yeah, I'm excited to see how the next book is. Because we did get a lot of Matt, oh not uh, Rand and um, Egrain this book, so I'm excited to see how the other side of the casting is. Because I remember I was like, oh Tam is here, like that was fast, but knowing that there is gonna be scenes from that side, is like relieving for me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we'll we'll get those uh, next time. What else is there? Uh, Perrin. Not much happens with him. <laughs> yeah, we just mostly with Perrin we get it's, uh, flashes of, like to know like where he is, um, depending like on the timeline, like to get the timeline straight. But the yeah. It's uh, next book that we'll get to. The only thing of note to uh, not really talk about but to mention is the fact that he doesn't know that Fael killed Masima, which is interesting. She's like, oh yeah, he must have gone with all his possessions. And he's like, no, he, he doesn't, doesn't like possessions. Like, <laughs> and he doesn't wonder about it, so... Um, one thing is that I was shocked we didn't get Mazum Tame after that very ominous epilogue <laughs> from the last book. I was waiting for him to show up and cause chaos as the Lord of Chaos. <laughs> but you didn't. You didn't show up. Yeah. Just curious to see what you think about that. Uh, well, I guess it's a prediction time, um, because I haven't really made any outside of the, yep. uh, I don't even know if I made one today. Um, huh, Massim Tame, now that I know that the tower is back. Uh, I wonder if the Sanshin are going to attack the Black Tower next and try to take all the male channelers, or at least the water uh, Aes Sedai. The Aes Sedai who became waters. I wonder if they'll uh, leash them and then take them. Because they mentioned that it wasn't even like a battle like for the White Tower. It was just trying to take as many Moath Domine as they could. And that was like really interesting. They didn't yeah. send everything they it could. It was a raid, uh, like to attack uh, Rand get as many as they could out of the way. That was a good plan, honestly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like, from the... Uh, Sunshine POV, like, it was a good plan. Um... I need... Uh, I need to provide a better prediction, probably. About... 
tie him expe uh, specifically. Um, Logan didn't show up. Oh my gosh. I didn't even think about him. He didn't. Hmm. Uh, he's supposed to have some glory going on. So. Maybe he and Ren team up. I've been saying this forever. I want them to team up. Maybe um, they go together to the last battle. Well, at least to Tarin's gap. Because Lion wasn't in this book either. But I did peep at the prologue of the next book. Because I was curious what the POV was. And I saw it was Lion. And I was like, dang it, I want to start it now. Because I saw it was Lion. <laughs> and I was like, why did I look? I shouldn't have done that now. I'm like really wanting to read it but uh you'll be able to read it now yeah i think massive and tame logain and who's the other one uh there's another big head honcho at the black tower or maybe it's just them two but uh i think they're gonna be attacked by well, the are there yeah i think they're gonna be attacked by the sanction massive tame is gonna with his weird secret group that he won't tell anyone about will link do some crazy stuff and then attack the white tower because i didn't feel because i don't think that was the battle for the white tower in my opinion i think that was just a raid i mean it is a raid but i think there's another one coming an actual battle for the white tower interesting look lan i i don't even want to give predictions on because I do have a spoiler, but, um, I hope we see Moraine next book. It has to be. I mean, it is Matt-centric. I'm going to be real mad if that's last book. Although it would be pretty uh -huh. funny if they showed up to the Tower of Genjai and got in, and they just saw, like, a skeleton with Moraine's, like, you know, cloak or whatever. And, just, no. and, and there's like a note she has, and she's like, you stupid wool-headed farmer, you were too late. You should have come here in book seven. <laughs> I thought about that, like, a couple days ago. And I was like, that would be pretty funny if he showed up. And she is, it's just a dusty white bone, like, skeleton. And it's like, you were too late, wool-headed bull or whatever uh, cusses they have for backwater country boys. <laughs> oh, I didn't think about this. Lan and Moraine need to meet up. I will rebel if they do not meet up again one last time. Because I don't know what's going to happen. And so on. If... Yeah. Yeah, I guess they are best friends. Um, that'd be great. I don't know what they would do after rescuing Moraine. I guess just immediately go to Tarwin's Gap and help out Lan. But do, do they have people with them who can gateway? Because they all did go to Tarwin's uh, Gap in no. book one. So maybe they could just teleport them. Uh, well, Matt and, like, Tom, like, are alone. And Moraine doesn't know the way gateways because she was away when, uh, uh, Egwene discovered the female version of gateways. Well, oh my gosh. I hope so, we well, find she doesn't out. Know. I hope we find out what her questions and answers were. Because I really. Because we got the second one. We got, yeah, the second question answered. And what was it? It was like, how do I... He asked how to win the last battle. And it said um, that you must unite east, west, north, and south, or whatever. That was from last book. And in this book, his question was like, how do I survive? And the elf and, or whatever, said, um... You have to die so you can live. So I'm curious what that last question was, and I just want to know Moraine's three questions. 
and also the final matte one. How that turns out, because we got the daughter of the nine moons. We got him hanging. I think that was part of it, right? It's been so long. Yeah, so, um, so, uh, you marry Mons. We got that one. Uh, you will die and, uh, again, the most part, part of what was, uh, that's, um, the bale fire in, uh, book five. I mean, like, Matt was killed by, like, a lightning strike, uh, from Rabin in book five, right? And then, like, along with Avian and then Asmodian, but then ran the bale fire, Rabin, and brought them back. So that is the book, and uh, the other one, uh, which is the other one. You must give up the power. You you have to give up half of the power in order to save the world. I think that's what it was. Oh, half of the light of the world to save the world, yeah. Because that was the one where I, I said about that. he is going to learn how to channel. Like, this was book five. This is seven books ago. God, so long ago. But, like, I remember I said... Rand is going to die, and Matt will have to do it. Like, take... Because I said it was like a shard kind of thing with the vessels. Kind of like in the end of Hero of Ages, where a new vessel can become. And so, maybe he takes up the power somehow. I don't know how he would do that. But that was my theory back then. But now... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, like, how that would be done. I'm still leaning on the he has to channel or something, but he doesn't know how. Maybe he's chosen as a Forsaken. And he switches sides. No. Oh. That's the only way he can channel, right? He'll be given that by the Dark One. That's my new one. Fuck it. <laughs> I have no idea how that last prophecy will go. Well, they're pretty crazy predictions, but they're interesting, and I can't say anything. And I just want you to be terrible with my life and see your reactions to that, because it's great. <laughs> so, I think that's it. We don't have any other things to talk about. I threw out some really weird yeah. uh, theories. So we'll see if it comes true. I think one of them is probably going to come true. Which is the Moraine showing up to Tarvin's Gap and helping out Lan. I hope that happens. That would be awesome. Um, thank you, Cheyenne, for joining me. We're nearing the end. It's a very sad You're welcome. Uh, thing. <laughs> I, I, I feel it coming. After this book, I was like, oh man, two books. I'm two books away. Hope everyone uh, likes this. Let me know what you thought of this book. Uh, how you think of my weird theories, my out there theories. <laughs>